Ke hora te mārino, ke whakapapa tōnānu te moāna, e hoa hōrai me tato i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato i a tato katoa. May peace be widespread, may the sea be like greenstone, a pathway for all of us this day. Let us show respect for each other, for one another, find us all together. Namihi nui. Uh, I'll call the meeting and open the December 13th. <laughs> Thanks for our annual district council meeting. Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. I'd like to extend a welcome to our um, community board chairs. We've got Dave Ryan on the line and Warren Phillips. Thank you for taking part. Um, we have I'd like to ask for any apologies. Do we have any? Uh, my friend here, we do have Gary who will be coming from one very shortly. Has he joined us yet? No, he's taking some technical issues at the moment. Um, so, can I get a movement to uh, receive the apologies, please? Terry and Deli, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, we have a late item on the agenda, which we'll deal, deal with last. That is the appointment of a replacement director for Ari Kitagi Shulai Board of Directors. The reason this has uh, come up now is because uh, Mayor or former Mayor Sandra Gowdy was uh, a director on Ari Kitagi. She has now resigned, and there is a board meeting tomorrow. Um, so I'd like to seek council appointment of a director to replace a former mayor, Kelly. Uh, council is a one third shareholder of the ATSWL, the company formed to develop and own Trubelo Ford. Uh, the proposal is uh, that we receive the appointment of replacement director of Ariki Tangi Trubelo Ford, report dated 30th of December 2022. And the uh, that would appoint uh, Council Chief Executive Alien Laurie as a director of Aikitani to Limited to replace Sun Gamma. Can I get a second? Oh, sorry, this, this will be dealt with last time. Um, so that puts your heads up of the item, late item on the agenda, and we will deal with this at the end of the meeting. <laughs> Oh, well, wait, wait. John Morrissey and all those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, next item on the agenda is public forum. And we have, um, we welcome uh, Adrian Patrick as uh, board chair for Thames. Um, Adrian, you can take a seat over there if you'd like any important stuff. Thank you. Um, in public forum, we've got uh, two uh, people who were due to present. One was Peter Collins, and Peter is unfortunately put his apologies in. Uh, he was to present on the Parkering of Wetlands. Uh, Peter's unwell. Um, however, he has sent a petition, um, and I'd like to receive the petition. This is being distributed to councillors. Um, I'd like to propose that the petition be received. Please, can I get a member to receive that petition? John, Rekha, uh, all those in favour? Aye. Uh, yeah. um, I'm guessing Peter will present at some later stage in the year. The other uh, public forum presenter is Helen McKay from Fong Matan. Um, I'd like to invite Helen, can you hear what? Can you hear us, Helen? Are you with us? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Um, so, Helen, we'd like to ask you to present. You have five minutes. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marina, Mayor Lynn and Council. Thank you very much for your time. Um, the way I represent um, here the Wongmata Resource Recovery Trust, where um, we're focused on bringing 
local reuse and repair centre to Whangamata in collaboration with the other centres around the Coromandel. We are already bringing accessible waste minimisation initiatives and supporting information to the Wangamata people. We welcome the new curbside services and look forward to working alongside the incoming waste management company and the TCDC solid waste team. It's early days to celebrate a reduction of waste to landfill. The development of the revised waste minimization strategy early next year is a very important component to the success of effective waste reduction. Um, there are two busy recovery centres already running on the Coromandel, as you know, with the third and with Yanga under construction, and the fourth <coughs> at, Witi, at Whangamata in the planning process. In the last 12 months, significant volumes of e-waste have been collected by our groups and sent on for reuse or recycling, thus keeping them out of the landfill. We feel that a pay-as-you-throw curbside approach is the best way for householders and businesses to explore all the reuse and recycle options available to reduce their waste. Provided these options exist right across the Coromandel and are supported by great information and education. As I'm sure you agree, our environment on the Coromandel is cherished by our people. They do want to do the right thing and protect it, given the opportunity to do so. We urge you to do a thorough job of it and continue to support the work of all our resource recovery centres in order to do so. Thank you. Helen, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate that. And do uh, we any councillors questions or any clarifications needed? There being none, I'd like to thank you and let you know that the waste strategy that we're working on will go out for public consultation in February next year. Um, Great. Excellent. We're not draft at the moment, so I'm sure you look forward to um, being a part of that and making a contribution. Thank you, Al. Thank you very much. We don't need to do anything else on the public forum. Oh, just to be. Sorry. So Robin and Martin. Okay, are there any items not on the agenda that we need to include? Where's the chair? We've done that already. We've done that already. Are there any conflicts of interest? There being none. Sorry, Peter. I was just wondering whether item. Um, 2.2 represents conflict of interest for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's all leave. <laughs> and if it does, I'd like to declare I've got a conflict. <laughs> um, I think item 2.2, people will be set down for the regulation of foreign so, but thank you. Um, all right, so. If there are no conflicts of interest, uh, we'll move on to item 1.5 minutes for confirmation. Um, could I get a mover and a seconder to move? I'll second. I'll move. So we're going to start with TCDC report uh, for 29th of November 2022. Sorry, mover again, sorry. Move, so much. Uh, Peter and Delhi. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. So I'm just unsure whether we need to go through each of the board item <coughs> separately. Our friend here, I would suggest that we do number two yep. and one hit because that's just to receive your community board minutes. For those, yeah. 
Then number three with Ben. Yep. Yeah. Then you should do a race separately. The race yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, so item two, could I get a mover please to receive the minutes from the following community board meetings? Coromandel Coal, Military Bay, Tyrell Tawanui, Bonamata, and Thames. I'll move. Rebecca and John Grant, all those in favour? Aye. 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 It's carried. Uh, item three confirms TCDC minutes for the meetings held on 2nd of November and 8th of November. Can I get a move, please? Terry? Yeah. Peter, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Items carried. Um, item four approves the Fongatar Community Board recommendations that the Chief Executive undertakes further investigations on the Hetherington Road Cycle Bay project. Specifically on consent requirements, building options for the bridge and community engagement are undertaken and report back to the board at a future meeting. Can I get a move on this? Happy to move. Terry, seconder, Delhi. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Two items carried. Item five, the Tyrua Parliamentary Community Board recommendation for a license to occupy road reserve for parking flat in 31 Tyrua Terrace. So I will put Tim Parson and Tim Pickering for a period of 20 years. I think I'd like to do that individually. Should I get a move for that? Happy to be Terry, second that. I think it's Rebecca, any discussion on that? There being none, all those in favour? Aye. Terry? Through the Chair, can I just raise one thing? Sure. On page 21 of the agenda, there's an out of cycle budget request. Mm -hmm. uh, my apologies, this was omitted. And so we do need to get an approval for an out of cycle budget request of 30,000. For those fireworks? Yes. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll go through um, item 5, A, B, C, and We'll add that to D. Yes, is that okay? Because it's time to find the movement. So, item B. Uh, to delegate the chief executive powers to agree to the specific terms for the license to occupy. Uh, Move up, please. Peter, seconder, Delhi, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. The final speed, which is that, I'm sorry, we'll make it request. Oh, it is there. Okay, please. great. Thank okay. you. So just ignore everything, Ari, <laughs> recently. Mm. Oh, okay. Oh, it's in is that okay in its current form? There's nothing else. Okay, so I can see the other cycle budget request of thirty thousand dollars from 22, 23, and 23, 24 financial years. Tyrell Power and retain retain earnings to the Tyrell Power and Promotions Incorporated to organise and manage the annual New Year's Eve fireworks display in Tyrell Power. I'm happy to move. Terry, second. Peter, thank you. Any discussion on this? Uh, just a, a question through the chair. I'm supportive of this. I understand it's a very successful event, so it's just for information purposes, really, um, as to why this is an outer cycle and coming through at this stage. I don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, you want to speak to this? Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, in the past, it's been publicly. Uh, subscribe to, plus they've given them a grant, an annual community grant. Um, of course, last year it didn't happen because of COVID, but the donations that gradually have been uh, falling away. So we want to, we cannot, if I would lose my head, if we took the, fu the funding away from this. It's become a very popular and expected event each year, so we want to put it on a more firmer um, funding. So this is why we, this is this came from. I need to understand uh, our manager this idea. So yeah, so we've got to keep it going. So thank you, Warwick. So just acknowledging uh, Warwick 
as chair of Tauru Poetry and Community Board. Thank you for that input. Um, my understanding is this is the only organized fireworks event in the whole Coromandel. Am I right? Is anyone aware of any other? I think we are. I think uh, it's, sorry, Mark. Yeah, um, I feel unable to support this. Um, it, 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 it seems that it, it's an event that happens um, close to midnight. Lots of people could watch it from their house. I don't see how there's a whole lot of um, business um, opportunities for business to benefit from it and the idea that we're paying $30,000 for something intangible that we get, we don't have anything left at the end of it, um, just doesn't sit right with me. So um, I'll be voting against it. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, it's from yeah. Gary Gottlieb here. It, it certainly brings a lot of people into town and they stay for some days, if not more. And it's an event that's talked about by everyone in Pauanui and Tarua, and people come from all over the place. Thank you, Councillor Gottlieb. Yeah, Gottlieb. just through the chair, I'd just like to speak in support of it. It does bring the two towns together, Pauanui and Tarua, and they uh, gather around the harbour, and it is a New Year's Eve, and it's uh, an event that has been there for a long time and really supported. And uh, you'll find that it's uh, well supported by both communities. So I think it's a great opportunity to bring those two communities together. So I support it. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion? Probably. I would just add and continue to offer my support for this. Um, however, I, I would just as a word of caution, I think when it's done for one area, it, um, it does raise questions as to who else might be asking and could this become a, instead of a $30,000 cost, a $150,000 cost, for example. Yeah, just through the chair, it's, it's locally funded uh, yeah. and I think they would like to put that into the long-term plan when it comes around. It's just the time we sort this time around and it would go through a two, two steps and then go into the long-term plan if it was decided, from locally funded. I think from my small involvement in public events and on the fringes of fireworks display, an organised fireworks display in Pitiana, which used to happen, um, the, the impediments and the organisational barriers in the way now, with the health and safety law and the permits and consents required, um, have probably stopped a lot of the other organised ones happening. Um, and that's I think why this is the only one that's left. The fact that this is still in place, I think is a credit to the people of Taiwan. Robin. So does the 30,000, is that all of the costs included? I understand the 30,000 does put the whole project together. It goes on a barge. They've got an organised barge that they keep and they put that out into the harbour. Yep. And they have a, a specialist come in and set it up. And it goes for about 15, 20 minutes. So it's quite a lengthy display. Um, and um, it's all very uh, health and safety organised. So people can watch from a distance. I'm not disputing that, Terry, at all. I'm just asking what the total cost is. So yeah. if this is the 30,000, 30, that's all. OK, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? There being none, I'd like to put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Councillor Broadley, would you like that recorded? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. All right, motion is carried. Uh, I'm six. Uh, the council approves the tenants or recommendations that council receives the gifts of the Woden and Miners Gate sculptures from Thames Public Art Trust. Following installation on the Hauraki Rail Trail, me and council will own and maintain the two sculptures to the length of their useful life, and B, that council approved an annual cost of $5,432.31, excluding DST, from 2023 to 2024 to maintain and ensure the Interbogan and Lionel Gate sculptures to the length of their useful life. Can I get a receipt of uh, um, can we receive that, please? Robin and Martin. Uh, any discussion? <coughs> the motion, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. 
just a bit muted. Quiet. <laughs> um, motion is carried. Thank you. And I think um, it's probably worth noting that uh, the Thames Public Art Trust uh, deserve a vote of thanks for these contributions and the other ones that are going up around. Uh, I think it's been some support that. really good work going on. Could we put that in the? I think we can. Can we note that, please? Do we need to turn it into a formal motion for our thanks to the Thames Public Art Trust? Let's add it to the end. We can add it. Yep. All right. So the motion is that we thank the Thames Public Art Trust for these two sculptures and for the other pieces that they've installed in recent times around the Thames district. Um, can I get a move for that, please? And a seconder. So, Martin and Daly, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 2.1 committee structures and appointments. Can I get a mover and a seconder to receive the motion, please? Yes, I move. Terry and John Brown. Thank you. Um, so you're all familiar with the proposed committee structures. I'll take the, the report and the proposals as read. Do we have any discussion? There being none, I'd like to put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? The motion is carried. Thank you for your support and putting this together. It has been a bit of a journey, but I think we're on a good path. Um, and just a note, as you'll see at the bottom, that the report will be provided to a council meeting in the few you provide further advice, advice on the proposed additional standard methods. Um, Chief Executive has under control. Uh, item 2.2, the letters. Sorry, can I just. So that we were voting on all those resolutions, the, the six resolutions. Yes. Okay. No, I did not understand that. I'm oh, sorry. Was there some discussion, Councillor? Um, <clears throat> I I had some comments around the terms of reference and of both the CE and the risk and assurance. Um, yeah. Do you want to discuss those here or would you rather take them offline? Um, I'd just, if I can just read through my notes briefly. <laughs> um, I, I, there are some questions I'd like if, just to ask generally if, if I could do that. Am I allowed to do that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, sorry. So with the with the um, risk and assurance committees um, in the in the purpose. Um, oversight and preparation of the long term plan, et cetera, et cetera. Does, is there anything that needs to happen with regards to monitoring the progress around? So it's, it's um, the committee is responsible for the review of the oversight of the preparation, but doesn't actually talk about uh, the, the progress and whether the, whether the, or risk and assurance committee is satisfied that we're making progress strategically, and and I'm and it's probably more a question for understanding because maybe that it gets covered in a in a, a separate way, and I'll and I'll just bounce off that this a little bit, um, and we we outline things like um, health and safety and. Uh, you know, some of those that are risk factor. We don't seem to talk specifically about 
culture or morale or anything kind of around about people. And I wondered whether that was a function that needed to sit in here or is that covered off in a different way? Because I, in my view, those sorts of things are as important as health and safety, et cetera, et cetera. Um, third question was, I was wanting to understand what CCOs we have. I know we're part of the, the um, what it, you know, whatever it is, we're a member of the CCO that's owned by several councils, but I was just wondering what other ones that we are involved in that this would therefore apply to. Are you referring to COLAB or LGFA, local government? Oh, LGFA is what I think there, yeah. yep. Um, so, Council Rebel, um, please um, complete the question, and I'm, what I might do is ask our Chief Executive to maybe address those. I, I, I know that, that it's a full committee of Council, and there will be ample opportunity to drill down into all of the detail and get answers yeah. to the questions. And then the final question was just related to the fact that this is a full committee of council, uh, why is that? And does that necessarily mean that there is the appropriate expertise to cover off things like, and one of the things that comes to my mind is the whole threats we have these days around cyber security, for instance. Um, and you know, Martin's probably the closest person to anything related to cyber security. And I, and I see that as a, as a major as well. So I just those were questions that I had around those, the terms of reference. So maybe I can address a couple of things. The, the reason it's a full committee of council is that it's required to get. Um, we have to have a full, it's my understanding, no? or it's a choice, and it's a choice that this council has always made. So please correct me if I'm wrong on you. Yeah, well, if I could speak to that one. Um, there's different practices with the risk committees, or risk insurance as well. Um, some councils have reduced numbers around the table, so we can spend more time going down. Um, other councils see it as such an important um, function that they want all of the councils around the table. My personal experience is I've seen it both, and the, given we don't have a lot of committees um, full stop, there, there's a potential for there to be an A team and B team, if you like, for those that are on the risk insurance and those that aren't. Um, but at the end of the day, it's your choice as to how you see that um, panning out. And in this case, the workshop that we had a few weeks ago, um, we discussed it being a, a committee of the whole. But at the end of the day, it's your choice. Um, can, I, can I just respond to that? Because I think in the, what I read here is one of the things is there is an expectation that we as councillors upskill ourselves and equip ourselves on all these matters. And, all, and I just kind of think that's suicidal. You know, if we are wanting to each of us to upskill ourselves in certain areas, I have zero interest in upskilling myself in legal matters, et cetera, et cetera. Yet that's what's communicated here, that there is that expectation. So I just... If I can tell you, I don't know that that's the case. You, you sit here in a government's role, not an expert role. And in fact, sometimes sitting here as an expert can be a problem because actually the experts are reporting to you. So you're relying on the folk over the back there to provide their expertise and for you to bring the government skills to bear. Um, and uh, recall, we do have an, uh, Bruce Robertson in the chair, and he's the independent, and he brings a huge amount of governance expertise um, to the table. So that, that would be my response to that. Given to go double deep, you rely on your experts. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Terry and John. So just to add a little bit more, Peter, also the, on the health and safety side, we have a very, very informed discussion and, and presentation from Paku, both on staff and risks, where they fit, very, very clearly understand where our issues are. So I think that's a very well covered through the board and risk, and that's where it comes through that channel. So it's really important for us all to sit around the table and hear that side of it. So I find that's very well covered through that meeting. So, yeah, risk and assurance is the reason I sleep well at night. The existence of that committee is actually really, really important um, for all of us, and I do believe we all need to be sitting at the table because um, with Bruce, our independent chair, his knowledge of local government and how councils work and identifying risks is is absolutely, absolutely 
exceptional. And um, without them, I mean, in the old days, it was chaired by the council, and you're right about lay people. It was it was dangerous. It was a dangerous square the council's been. But now with an independent like Bruce, believe you me, you will sleep a lot better at night with them in charge and all of us sitting around the table. Um, just have two little things really to say. Um, at the beginning of last triennium, Sally and I were not originally part of the Audit and Risk Committee, but we mm -hmm. chose to attend the meetings voluntarily until we were co-opted onto it because the level of understanding that we needed in order to be able to do our jobs came from that committee. Um, and which sort of leads on to the second point is that at sitting around this table, I was elected to represent the people, and that is the role that I bring and the expertise that I have here. Um, and so that was the other thing I'd caution. We all bring skills that we have from our previous life, but I can't apply my skills as a teacher or whatever in this particular setting because I have to put everything through the lens of the counsellor. And so that's why it's really good to be able to all sit around the table remember the role that we sit here in and remember the information that we've been given, as Aileen said, by the experts that are here to advise us. Yeah. So um, in discussing the makeup of committees with a number of the other mayors, um, I've had some fairly strong advice that it's good practice to have the whole committee involved in risk and assurance. It is such an important function of council. Um, and it also allows every councillor to be fully um, up to date with the important matters that we're doing. The other really strong piece of advice, which we followed as a council for a number of years, is the independent chair. And Bruce Robertson uh, is, has a good reputation with um, a lot of experience in that governance oversight of risk and assurance. Billy. Um, I'd like to, to chair, I'd like to support Peter in his, in his question. I think that was a really good question to ask. And I think the ensuing conversation that we've had has been really healthy and it's helped me understand also. Um, and Aileen's reminder that the experts are there to inform us. So rather than Peter feeling like you've just been schooled by... Oh, no, no, no. no, 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 no. I, I actually support the question because it has clarified a few things in my mind. So it's yeah, a good question. That's to and that's what the school is for. So please don't hesitate to, to ask those questions. So the one thing I didn't comment on was the content. It was um, the, the question about is, is are our risks all listed off? Um, it's actually quite flexible. So um, the importance of elected members is when you come to the table on this risk that you see that perhaps your organisation hasn't seen, you can ask us to go away and have a look at something. Under, under risk management, it talks about um, risk frameworks and it talks about deep dives into strategic risks. Well, those are for you to determine um, with the vice what you think the risks are and what actually we need to do deep dives into. So in terms of the content of what the committee might do, um, yeah, Bring, bring your thinking to bear on the, on the committee um, and make sure the risks that you see are being dealt with would be my advice. Uh, so just to answer your question, Councillor Rebel, on CCOs, um, my understanding is that uh, the LGFA is 20% owned by government and 80% owned by the member councils. Um, is, I'm not sure that that's regarded as a CCO. No, not mine. Um, it is. It is. No, no, so it is a CCO. Council control organisation. Why less? Why less? Why Yes, sir. That's a CCO. Yeah. Yeah. So the membership of makeup of CoLab is how many councils? Um, and Colab's function is to um, uh, provide um, uh, sourcing advantages um, and economies of scale to give us better um, deals and lost ones on various different. Um, I just I wanted to understand which ones they were, and it's just yeah, those two. Just those. Okay. Um, any other questions? Any other discussion? Um, just to, to Aileen, to the, my question about um, culture and morale and, and what have you, that 
your response on that is? Uh, yes, it's very much part of the work program. So this, right. this is the terms of reference, which is a okay. more thing sets up framework sitting under that for work program that is in part determined by the elected membership. Um, and over time, you'll see issues and will be picked up. But the, the people and culture one just before I arrived was quite significantly important that went to the committee. Um, and so um, it's on a, a regular schedule for reporting um, via Taku looks after the committee and, and pulls together those reports on a regular basis. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Real. Okay, discussion. Very thank you. And, um, we've already passed this motion, so we'll move on to uh, 2.2. Um, perhaps, Councillor Real, you'd like to leave the room? Second <laughs> <laughs> um, Could I get a mover and a second to please to receive the motion? I'll move. I'll leave the the motion is that TCDC receives the elected members' remuneration report dated to the end of November and endorses the proposed remuneration schedule and requests the Chief Executive to forward the resolution to the remuneration authority. Is there any discussion on the motion? There being none, I'd like to put it put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, council meeting schedule item 2.3. Can I get a little of these lists? Yeah, over the mails. Walker. I'll second. Okay. Motion is that the Thames Coromandel District Council receives the 2023 council meeting schedule until the date of 25th of November and approves the council meeting agenda as contained in attachment A of the agenda report. Any discussion? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, you've got some alternative um, uh, plans of uh, workshops in here. Those workshops, would say, aren't defined as yet. Is that right? Council workshop? Yeah, right. So they'll just, just be placeholder. Placeholder. Well. Place well. They're probably taking guess what they might be. But yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, that oh, I'd like to. Um, I'll put in a leave of absence in July that uh, we're going away. So I'll put that through. So. Ariana knows what's going on there. I'd like to be able to do that. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was really around those two questions about those workshops and how they fit it in. Pretty busy calendar. Yes. Councillor has a question. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to pause for a couple of minutes because I need your glasses. <laughs> I can't read this. So, can we just put a hold on things for three minutes? So we're only adopting attachment A. So this is attachment B. What about the Oh, okay. it's, it's called Council Workshop, John. Oh. Yeah. Yes. So, just a comment on the schedule. There are external meetings which have yet to be put on here. Some of the organisations, for example, some of the Defence Emergency Management, the Councillor Grant and I went to yesterday. Those schedules were only signed off at that meeting yesterday, so they aren't on this schedule. So um, the only other comment that I'd make is on the first reading that the schedule looks pretty packed, especially the second page, but bear in mind that we have five community boards and not every councillor is involved in those community board meetings, which are not <laughs> this meeting. We're always welcome to attend. Um, so, uh, on the surface, it looks pretty packed schedule, and yeah. there's I think, more to go on there. So, I think um, it was good that it's all front ended on the week Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, kind of in your head to get thinking if there's a meeting Thursday or Friday, it's a, exceptional rather than. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Um, Councillor Rill, thank you. 
Um, okay. Robert, sorry. I just want to put a vote of thanks that there appear to be not as many meetings during the school holidays as we have had in previous years, and I just really want to say my appreciation for that. Thank you. Through the chair, um, the bits and pain that is referring to the yep. school holidays. Mm. Well done. Mm. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to say thanks to Aaron and the team for putting this. There's a lot of work gone into this. A lot of work. With the chair, may I ask, can we get like an A3 print out of this? Uh, yeah. Lemon yeah. Oh, lemon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't need my laminated again. Thank you. Um, laminating is quite good because you can drop them. Yeah. No, laminating Lemonade. is bad for the planet then because yeah. it's a whole you level of ice. So it would be very helpful if that could be translated into an electronic placeholder as well into the meeting calendar. So I think very helpful for yeah. forward planning. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that so um, I, I had while um, the mayor was out of the room, I just checked with my fellow councillor. But at the moment, we're actually just proving the attachment A, aren't we? Not the B, which has got the community uh, networking days on them. We don't need to prove that as part of the meeting. We just wanted to give you visibility. Appreciate so, Thank so you. are the community networking meetings intended to be instead of community board workshops, or will there be additional workshops potentially? Yeah, um, there would only be workshops if we needed to do stuff on the five rules of right, the okay. policy and community, and that would usually occur after the formal meeting. So, okay. just trying to. Create some separation between the two. So, so, so why have we got so why have we got an attachment B then? Why is it Just to give you this of the full oh, okay. year. Oh, I see. Right, yeah. okay. Thank you. I was just wondering whether the um, community board chairs had any comment on the timetable. Thank you. Warwick. Um, while we all would love to have January off, um, the reality is from some of the things that we've attended been part of recently is that there are a number of submissions and um, there's a lot of background work going on um, in that civil defence meeting that we went to yesterday. Uh, there is a submission that has to be in, I think, 28th of January, end of January. Um, so some areas the work continues with the budget or not. Okay, any other discussion? Um, through the chair, is there any idea or um, tentative dates around the Manai? Through the chair, that is on the 31st. Oh, January. Yeah. 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 It's just shown as a workshop. Through the chair, that the electronic invites will be sent after this is approved. Cool. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Um, right. Any other discussion? I'd like to put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Motion is carried. Thank and a vote of thanks to staff for the work yeah. of this. This is like a military um, Just to ask, um, if I could just ask Ari a question. So, you send those invites out. So it might just be worth telling um, newer members that you're going to get an absolute um, yeah. lot of emails. But when you do an RSVP, and I know some people religiously do RSVPs and others don't, but that's fine. It has the option about email organiser. I always just turn that off because I figure you've sent hundreds out, you probably don't want hundreds back. Would that be your preferred thing to not be for people to slide the, the email organiser thing off to the left to make sure you don't get a lot of responses back? 
you don't care? Yeah, um, we don't. We, we don't really mind. Okay. Yeah. Usually, elected members will let us know well in advance so if they're going to be an apology for a message, but okay. it's not a good one. Thank you. Item 2.4, appointment of Red Strike for the Pecuniary Interest Register. Um, I'd like to I'll move it. Uh, Terry Walker to move and a second it, please. John I'll Gray. second it. Go. Let's, let's have Gary second that because it is the second end of the year. Uh, the motion is that the TCDC receives the appointment of registrar for the Community Interest Register report dated 23rd of November and appoints the Chief Executive as the registrar for the Community Interest Register under Section 5 or Division 1 of the Local Government Act 2002 and delegates all of the local government powers contained in Section 54A G of the LGA 2002 to the Chief Executive, including the power to appoint the registrar. Um, any discussion? Councillor Rivera. Um, yes, like I have two questions. Um, first one is um, what will be publicly available, available is a summary. And I'm just wondering what, the, what we should expect a summary might look like, uh, because summaries can be fulsome or summaries can be <laughs> incredibly brief. Um, and what is what might be in uh, whoever we appoint as the registrar might what might, what might be in his or her mind about that. So the chief executive will be the registrar. Okay. The chief executive will sub delegate, can't you? Okay. <laughs> and the function will be delegated to Aku Edwards, yeah. who's um, our risk manager, um, and he's working through at the moment. So this is new. This is this came into law, I think, in July this year, and so nobody's done these yet. So we'll be looking at uh, best practice um, and taking guidance from others about what these look like and what the nature of the summary looks like. Um, I have seen re uh, elected member uh, interests registers before, and they're really complicated complex and detailed. Um, if my previous experience has been to go by, so I imagine this will be even more complex and more detailed. So summarise will be some sort of um, challenge in summarising that into something that's publicly consumable, which is the purpose of the um, provisions in the law. Will that summary come back to, will the format of that summary come back to Council before it's I don't it? think there's any requirement for that to happen. Are we able to request that to happen? Oh, please. <laughs> I'm look, happy to share it, but I think at the end of the day, it'll be a, a professional mm -hmm. decision from a professional person um, sure. taking into account these questions. I, I think it would be helpful for all of us who are, <laughs> who are under, having to do this to understand what is going to be out there before yes. it is out there. That, so that would be behind my request. Does it need to come back to council, or can it come back to council rules for um, for review of the information? Hello, draft, draft, won't you? Just a concept well, that went out. My, under like? my understanding is that it, it doesn't come back to council to sign off because it is set in law and yeah. it's a professional decision what it looks like. But um, in the interest of most clients, I'm happy to share it before we put it in. So, uh, does that ask you a question? Councillor Ripples, whether it comes back to individual councillors rather than council meeting? Uh, the benefit of that being? Uh, and okay. So, Aileen says no surprises, so that the summary is done. Each councillor has a look at that because they are publicly available. And I think for councillors to have the opportunity to have a look at that information before it goes out to the public. Um, might make feel that might make councillors feel more comfortable. I think it's, it's it's standard, it's, it's law, isn't it? So mm -hmm. nothing we can do about it, really. But honestly, uh, this idea of template, this is how it's laid out. Best practice. So just to speak, Lee, this while this provision is new, the thing that's new is for us to actually put it in the public arena. Mm -hmm. In the past, we've always had a register, which is um, something that's been um, really interesting and um, not very well organised, and so on. Um, and that's been available on request, so anyone can walk in and say, can I see the interest for councillor so-and-so? 
<clears throat> then we look at the breach of peak over the interests. But the provision now is saying that we need to summarise that and put, make it publicly available. So it's sort of a sim similar to how we're back in the past, we're just summarising and making it available rather um, than people having to request it. Does it now line up with um, the central government requirements for members of parliament? Is that yes, sorry, yeah. that's what we thought it was before this year. Right? Well, they've had to do it for a while. Local government has had to um, have it available but not publicly, and I think it will go on our website. That will be the place. Yeah, it yeah. will go on the website. So, Council Roger. But presumably, there's no requirement within that legislation for staff to, um, like before a meeting, for instance, and I'll use uh, Adrian as an example here. If we were discussing dog control bylaws and Adrian's got dogs, there's no requirement within that legislation for staff to look at this and go, uh, actually, to look at the registrar before a meeting and say, actually, Adrian, we think you might be. Um, there might be a conflict there, presumably that's not in that this legislation. This is a register of pecuniary yeah. interest. Right, okay, sorry, bad oh, example. <laughs> this is purely pecuniary. Right, <clears throat> but there's no requirement for staff to look at that register. No, and but staff might look at it. So at the end of the day, interest, declaring an interest is your as elected member mm -hmm. responsibility. So it's up to you to, to be declaring whatever interest you may have. But council staff will keep an eye on it um, and we Council, it's generally a practice that we've crossed check events, for example, the company staff base, just to make sure that it's got through it. Um, and council staff may keep an eye on it because there are instances where potentially we're dealing with something confidential. Mm -hmm. If there's an interest and we send you that information, then we're probably creating a problem by sending you that information. So we, we will keep an eye on it just, just for those practical things, rather than because it's a legal provision, a legal requirement to do so. Any further discussion? There being none, I'd like to put the motion. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Lady. Um, right, item 2.5, Code of Conduct. Can I get a move up, please, to receive the motion? Kelly, second that. I'll second that. Rico, thank you. Um, the motion is that the TCDC receives the Code Conduct Report dated 23rd of November 2022. Um, I'll take the report as read. Um, but we revoke the 2019 TCDC Council Code of Conduct and adopt the new Code of Conduct 2022, which includes a two step assessment process for dealing with alleged breaches and use binding recommendations from the investigator that we resolve to appoint the chair of the risk and assurance committee as the initial, actually what I might do, and take a step back, what I might do is take these in separate parts because they are in the parts. So I'd like to go to um, Item one, so we've got a mover and a seconder to receive the Code of Conduct. Uh, item two, that we revoke the 2019 Code of Conduct. Can I get a mover, please? Oh. John Morrissey, seconder, John Grant, all those in favour? Aye. Are, 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 we, are we revoking that uh, that one? We're revoking the 2019 Code Yeah, 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 but, but, but I, I have... Does it save me talking much? I sent a, an email before my laptop went mad on me, uh, mm -hmm. setting out a few concerns I have. Okay. And uh, it might be a good idea if people just read that rather than me talking. So, uh, uh, Councillor Godley, can I just so that we're clear on what we're discussing? Can I make it? So, I just ask you to clarify that you are talking to item two which revokes the 2019 code of conduct is that what you were no what what, I, what i'm saying we need to reflect whether we revoke that whether we amend it uh we need to that's why i raised a number of issues in there because uh there are some real concerns i have and that's why i i, I just got, did a brief pricey and i don't know if people actually saw it but um i didn't have a chance to read it i'm sorry um, but others did yeah. Lynn. 
I didn't get it. I haven't I read that email. It. And so and I didn't well, get it. I, I haven't read it. I don't know. I when I checked my email this morning, it wasn't there. I think in the interest of transparency, it would be better for Councillor Gottlieb to actually outline them rather than us all go. Well, well I, I, I can read them to you if you want. Um, or we'll put them in different words, whatever. So, can, Councillor Gottlieb, can we what I'd like to do is try and work through this step by step. Well, well, well I don't think we can because I, I'm saying we may end up keeping the 2019 one as it is, or with amendments, uh, or we move to do the uh, the the new proposed one as right. is, or with amendments. And and, and I, uh, in in short, I'm really saying in the end, there's a lot of legal fishhooks here, and uh, be it on your own head if you but don't take some legal advice on it. That's my feeling. Understand. So, what I, in that case, and I hear what you're saying. What I'd like to suggest is, rather than go through step by step, we've got um, we've received the report. I'd like to open it up now for discussion on uh, the whole resolution, which is to revoke the 2019 and adopt the new code of conduct. So before we go through those step by step, I'll open it up to general discussion and uh, invite you, Councillor Gottlieb, to um, go through the concerns that you have and uh, your uh, summary of what you sent through this morning, which a number of us didn't see. Yes, well, what happened was uh, the, 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 we should have before you the code of 2019 that uh, in November of 2019. And I hope councillors have that before them because they need to compare that to what's being proposed. Um, that was far more uh, in-house dealing with it, and that has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, Martin got it. I, I, my computer broke down, and that's why it was going crazy. And uh, Martin has it, and a few of, I think Peter has it. Um, it, it wouldn't allow me to send it through to council distribution, and um, if anyone could forward it on to the other councillors, it will save me going on like a, a broken clock. Um, let me let me go to um, Delhi before, and I'll come back to you, councillor Delhi. Um, so I've taken the time, and and it's a hefty couple of documents. I've taken the time to go through these documents, and if Councillor Gottlieb had, um, with respect, had concerns, I would have needed his email two or three days ago to give good, um, to do good due diligence on what um, his concerns are. I reached the point where I was happy to revoke the older um, code of conduct and to have a discussion around the new one. So um, it's a little bit frustrating because I feel it's putting us in a spot to have this discussion now. Um, with an email that we haven't received yet. So well, uh, I, 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 okay, let me tell you. Okay. I, I, I've read this. I read this briefly twice. I woke up last night. At, and I, can I just finish, please? I woke up last night at two thirty and spent about two hours looking at it, and then this morning I got my email to do it, and my computer went absolutely crazy on me. And that's why it didn't get passed through. So uh, the end result is when you actually confront a problem and you deal with it, this is a field I know a little bit about. And I can tell you that one of the concerns I have with what's proposed with the new one is that it is open to uh, judicial review, um, breach of Bill of Rights, numerous, numerous problems that will exist in that that will be far more litigious than what we have in the old one. We may want to slightly improve the old one. I don't know, but we need to look at the options. Yeah, okay. just sorry, John, I'll go to Robin, please. No. Oh, sorry, Gary, John, John here. Hey, um, you referred to the Bill of Rights. Can you just give me a quick rundown on what the breaches are you see in the Bill of Rights, please, Gary? Well, well, well in fact, it actually refers in there, because when I started reading it, Again, in detail, it's the ungodly hour this morning. Uh, it, it, I kept saying to myself, restorative justice, Bill of Rights, there's, there's so many problems here. And it's actually worded in page, um, where is it? Um, that is on page 85. Um, 
All actions taken in the implementation of policy must be consistent with the Bill of Rights. No appeal is included in the Code of Conduct. Members who are unhappy with an independent investigator's decision have access to judicial review and or the ombudsman. Now, let me just tell you, there's been a few cases recently, one of which I know very well, uh, where the Complaints Committee of the New Zealand Law Society has been taken on to judicial review on the basis of the investigation. And the investigator, there are no terms of reference. There, there is nothing spelt out. And that's what we're going to go down, completely down, um, we, we need to have that, and that's why I keep repeating, we need to actually have a legal opinion on this because I have some real concerns. Now, let me just uh, go back a bit. Um, if we look at, um, uh, we've got, we, we, sorry? Yeah, that's it. you got me on the back foot a little bit, Gary, because I, I never received your email, so I'm just going, I'm trying to grab hold of what you're saying as you're saying, saying it, and I, and I saw this is actually, um, complying with the Bill of Rights and that it does offer mediation first between the parties. Uh, that option is there. Um, that was one of the issues you raised. What else, What else, Gary? Well, no, what, one of the things is that it, it can actually go, uh, if it goes, it's been proposed that uh, Bruce uh, Robertson become the assessor. And I don't have a problem with Bruce, but it, as we're all on that committee, if it involves one of us, it's going to cause potential conflict that may come from that to just a just the reality of the situation. Then, of course, we have the chief executive can bypass the assessor and go directly uh, to the investigator. And this is where the real problems are. The investigator does not have any real basis upon which the investigation is done. And that's what the recent judicial reviews have come out with the Law Society. But they've gone out in a fishing expedition, you can't do that. And this is a real problem. So we're, we're in the situation that um, uh, we, we have, that it, supposedly the investigator's decision is binding. That is unbelievable. That takes away from us councillors who probably know more about the whole reality of the situation. It's binding. We, we can't make any, have any say in it. And I find I, that extraordinary. I have the opposite view. I think the further away from the elected members that is, the better. By, That's the intention. By a Ms. Miles, Gary. Um, yeah. I, I'll, I'll go over to Councillor Robley. It, just, just, just around that. So it, it, it says that it's binding, but then it also says a sentence or so later. Um, members who are unhappy with the independent investigator has access to judicial review and or the Ombudsman office. So, well, sure. If you've got twenty thousand dollars, you can do a judicial review, and well, and if you and if you're going to go to if you're going to go to the Ombudsman's office, it might take about a year. So all I'm saying is we need to look at a process that will be done efficiently, and this is not going to happen that way. So yeah, and sorry, just to supplement, I mean, I think that. As councillor, as a councillor who isn't a legal expert, I see that this has come from LGNZ. I see that they would have had a significant amount of legal advice. Mm. I can't see. Uh, I would need some really glaring. Well, I mean, I don't know what I would need to see to be able to say no. This thing that's gone through LGNZ is has got a whole lot of holes in it, and for us to go to our own one. I see the whole point of the LGNZ one is that it's consistent across the country. Yes, there might be little tweaks and things have to be made as we go through the process if there's some really bad well, things that start to happen as a result of it. But I couldn't I can't see anything that would that would well, want me to well, well, what's the rush? What, what's the rush? To, what, why can't we at least get our legal our, our legal opinion on this that shouldn't take very long and because they will be aware of those judicial review decisions. And I'm, I'm just saying, if you want to go ahead with that, it's, it's your people's decision. I'm just putting you on notice, but, but so be it. I've told you. Thank you, Councillor Gottlieb. I'm going to go to Councillor Connell. Um, so through, through the chair, obviously this just hasn't come out of um, left field. This has been in the pot for a wee while. And... Um, could I have some indication, perhaps, from um, A Lane as CE, what is is the best practice? So I, I presume, you know, we again, as lay people, we've had something presented to us as best practice. 
we have been recommended that we um, revoke one and go with another one. Um, we just haven't invented this overnight. So could I have some background on what yes. other councils are doing? Thanks, Raylan. Yeah, so the, the background to this is it's actually in part being um, written by our own independent chair, Bruce Robertson. And so Bruce has been in, he's been in a number of code of conduct cases. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say all of but he's been involved in a, in a number of them where the previous code has um, created a whole lot of issues. Right. Um, and I, I can tell you, I've got personal experience with issues created by particularly the process end of the code. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of risk on the chief executive in handling these. Um, and there's also um, the current code, it's quite political. Um, and so Bruce, in, his, in, in drafting some of this, he had a couple of objectives. One is to depoliticise the process to make it safer for those folks that are having to handle the process and, and um, yeah, particularly protect the chief executive and, and protect the, the mayor and the, and the councillors that end up having to make the decisions under the previous code. The other one was that Bruce was really keen to um, put the mediation component into it, including the ability for it to be a confidential mediation, because often the issues escalate and they could have been dealt with quite simply, um, you know, with chat early on in the, in the process. So that was the other um, motivation in terms of the draft and all that. Um, so LGNZ have had a whole raft of people involved in it. They do have considerable expertise sitting behind them. And this code has been adopted by a number of councils. Um, but it is new, so, you know, there, there's always risk with something new. Um, and no doubt in three years' time we will have learned more and it will have been improved again. So, you know. Um, overall, I think my recommendation is that we should run with it, and we recommend that to you. Um, and it's on the basis of um, the significant issues that I think the previous code actually has in the process. Thank you, Eileen. Mm -hmm. um, through the chair, Gary, uh, you did mention that it would be on our heads. Uh, yeah, as a part of this council, you would be bound by the decision. It would be on your head too. Um, on page well, no, eight. No, 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 no. If I vote against it, it won't be. Um, on page 82, at the bottom of the page, there's a line that says one solution is for a local authority to agree to be bound by an independent investigator's recommendations. And that is one of the suggested resolutions. However, the second part of that paragraph says a slight variation would be to create an independent committee to consider independent investigators' recommendations. So one way that you could silence us and put this to bed is you could suggest a different motion to the one that we've got. Test it and see where you get to. Uh, that's page 82, did you say? Yep, that's the, the last paragraph. So, yeah, just through the chair if I can. So, yeah, Aileen, just, is the move of this of moving the responsibility away from the, yep. the political wing into a standalone investigator, is this the purpose? Is that the purpose? That's the deep analysis. Yes. Deep the process. Deep the process. Yes. That, that was one of the intentions right. in, in drafting the, right. the new code. Because before the mayor could do it, what you like, what thing, and make decisions, um, pretty strong. Um, at the end of the day, I think the head of membership would decide on the sanctions, right. and it would be very public. Yeah. Um, and that has led to some strength. So what I'd like to do now is. Um, Come back to the resolutions on the table. Uh, Councillor Gottlieb has um, raised some concerns, and I hear those concerns. Uh, however, as a council, I'd like to um, get an understanding of where the council table sits on this. So if we go to item two, and which is revokes the 2019 uh, Code of Conduct, I'd like to put that to the vote to see where we sit on that. So could I get um, all those in favour of item two? Aye. Aye. And those against? I am against. I'm just going to abstain. And I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So on the basis of that vote, with two abstentions, would you like those recorded? Yes, please. And one against, that motion is carried, which means that we have revoked the 2019 Code of Conduct.
Item three adopts the new code of conduct 2022, which is the LGNZ uh, format. Oh, sorry. Item three, can I get a mover and a seconder for item three, please? John. John and Robin, thank you. Robin, do you want to put your amendment you suggested? Oh, I think that was a sensible no, 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 no. I was suggesting that you could put the amendment through to see if you had any support because I um, don't support it. Well, am I wasting my breath? I tried no, to help you, but no, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Gottlieb. So the proposal is that we adopt 2022 Code of Conduct, which includes the use of the two-step assessment process and the use of binding recommendations to an investigator. Can I get... We've got a mover in a second. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Me. Councillor Gottlieb, that motion is carried. Thank you. Item four, that we resolve to appoint chair of the Risk and Assurance Committee as the initial assessor. I'll move that. I'll second that. Seconder, John and Rekha. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Motion is carried. Are you in favour of that, Councillor Gottlieb? Yes, I am. I, I said that in my, unfortunately, my laptop broke down, but um, yeah, that's what I said there, yeah. Thank you. This is the formal vote part of it, so we appreciate that. Um, and item five directs the chief executive to create a potential panel of independent investigators, including but not limited to the LGNZ recommended panel and report back to council for review and comment. Can I get a move? Second for that, please. Happy to do it. I'll move. John Second. Can I ask a question, please? Uh, on what basis would the panel be from? It seems a very wide basis. Is that going to be people with legal and um, uh, lo local government um, knowledge or what, what sort of combination? Councillor Godley, the, um, the makeup of the panel or the proposal is detailed in the report. No, I read that and, it was, and that was pretty vague. Right. Is there any other discussion on that? If not, I'd like to put it to the vote, please. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Motion is carried. Um, Councillor Godley, um, you've raised some important points, and I would like to explore those a bit more, but in terms of this resolution, uh, this one is carried, and I'm personally happy that we can move forward with the code of conduct, which we're required to do under the uh, so, Rika. Um, just through the chair, can we look at that council's distribution list? Because I think more than half of us didn't get the email that was that um, Gary was with. That, that may have more been an issue with Gary's laptop potentially. Right. Um, just in terms of the process that we've been through, um, what I was hearing, and this is only what I was hearing, was Gary recommending that we get a review, a legal review of the of the thing, and that was based, I assume, on his experience and expertise as a lawyer, which none of the rest of us have. And my thinking, the reason I abstained, was the fact that that's his particular area of expertise. If we were talking about another matter, and I don't know. Pick a, pick a matter, something to do with broad spectrum for radios. <laughs> and John said, you know, we need to do such and such. I'd be listening to what John had to say, and his expert opinion would mean, you know, well, we need to think about that tower or whatever. So I just want to encourage us um, to be thinking, uh, you know, when somebody comes with a, an area of expertise that I'm talking about is, does that, does that carry a bit of weight for us? as a council um, in, in that. So that's just my comment. Thank you, Philosopher. Yeah, and I just support what uh, Peter's saying. I think um, you know that uh, these discussions around the table, the, the expert advice from some is important. And Gary does bring that to the table and we should at least consider it. That's what it's all about. Just hear the story. We can make our decisions. We've made our decisions. 
move, move forward. So, yeah, yep. very good. Thank you. The only comment that I would make about that, I think the real relevant points is that would you bring good to have that few days ago? Yeah, yeah. 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 That was my point. Yeah. Uh, no, can I reiterate the point I made before and that we are elected at this table to sit as councillors. We are not employing Gary as our legal counsel. We have a legal counsel, we have a legal process. We have to make decisions based on experts that are robust. We cannot keep relying on each other for the expertise. So that's my sure. only call. But, but, but our, our lawyers have not given us any advice on this. That's my point. I know, but I just want to put that out there because we have to remember why we're here and how we sit here. Can I ask a quick main, uh, question around process? I would assume that our lawyers would have looked at a document like this. Oh, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. That's a you. Thank you, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we're learning as we go along. So I can listen to yeah. the story is important. Uh, Councillor Godley, did you have another comment? I couldn't hear what Aileen said. Uh, she was saying, um, or perhaps you would like to. Uh, it's new. It is a new document. And as I said, there is risk with the new document, and over time it will be refined as, as things don't work as well as they do, and um, might do. Um, my view is it's a substantial improvement on the previous one, particularly in the process sense. What I'm encouraged by and reassured by is within the proposed code of conduct, there are a number of mechanisms to uh, for mediation for um, solving problems before they escalate. And I was reassured by what I saw in the document, and I'm comfortable that it's an improvement over the 2019 document, which um, was not solving problems in the way it should have been. But the move was a different change, yes. different direction. There's enough flexibility and um, safeguards in there that, to make me feel comfortable. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, having said all that, can I just point out on page 97, I think they're supposed to be three, not 30 where it's outlining the number of, oh, no, no, hang on. Sorry, that's the next section, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just. You've lost me, councillor. Yeah, yeah, I've lost myself. So, <laughs> so this is a pecuniary interest register where it says register, registers must complete the following and a description of 30 main business activities. Is that the bit you're talking about? <clears throat> yeah, so it's, it is on page 97. Um, oh, yes, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, got there? Great, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Reed. Okay, moving on. How are we going for time? We're okay. Yeah. Right. Um, item 2.6 elected members' expenses and resources policy. If I can remember a receipt to receive this item, please. Um, I'll take these as read. There is nothing in there that I think um, should cause any issues, any discussion. So, just on the um, under the summary, uh, page 103, I just wanted to clarify it says community boards receive, members receive 500 for the communications allowance and it's been proposed that's increased to a thousand. Then it says this decision reflects blah 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 eliminating the need for printed copy. It is expected that member members pay for their own printing with the allowance received. Is that just referring to community board members? And uh, is this now saying that if you want a printed copy of the minutes you're going to have to pay for it? <laughs> I just want to clarify that because no I'll keep. I have the same question. We move electronically, and you do get an allowance, so mm. you should be able to use your allowance. And I do print right. occasionally, but yes, um, if I have to return my um, anything, I'll return it just to keep the paper copies. <laughs> I mean, I'm not against printed copies. I think, and 
some people work way better, you know, in schools and things as there are students who can't really work off electronic copies and are way better off paper copies and that time. But this just seems to be saying that members should pay for their own printing. Absolutely have to do that, but I'll turn out any councillor still deciding who wants to have a quick look at my paper copy because the electronic device is something I'll really yeah. charge you. Or a pay. <laughs> I just want to say uh, it's a uh, through the chair that the committee board's increase is really good because mm -hmm. these things cost money and five hundred dollars doesn't really cut it. So well done. Thank you. And on page 111 there's a date that has been deleted. Ah. Thank you. Which one? Uh, the 13th of November. November. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Thank you for that. Yes. I'm loving the detail. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll have a mover and a seconder. Uh, any further discussion? So I'd like to put the motion for those in favour. Uh, Aye. Motion to carry. Thank you. Um, item 2.7, non financial performance measures for 41 percent. <coughs> we can move and a second to receive this, please. I'll move. Second. Edgar and Robert. Robert. Meg. Hi. And we'd like to welcome you. You're not Meg. Meg's on the line. Give it a go, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Right. Um, I will invite you to go ahead. Who's presenting? I can take this one, Leslie. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to give the members a little bit of context because some of you might not be familiar with the quarterly reports. Um, so these quarterly reports, they link to part three of the LTP, which contains our non-financial performance measures. Um, and also the year of end, end of year targets for each of those measures. Um, and we use these quarterly reports to show how the council is tracking towards those end of year targets, which are set in the LTP. Um, so right now we are reporting on quarter one of this year, which runs from the 1st of July through to the end of September. Um, which is the report in front of you now. And um, I think that Bruce, Hints and I can see him in the back there, he'll be available as well to answer any questions about the operations group, which is a big part of this quarterly report. Thank you, Meg. So we'll take the report as read. Do we have any discussion or questions? Yeah, through the chair. Meg, uh, just the first one off the uh, rank, uh, cab off the rank is the uh, resealing servicing. You can see there's a uh, a quite a big um, change in the budget there, and it looks like they're going to review that. Um, That's for the roads and footpaths measure, Councillor Yeah, Walker. the percentage of sealed roads local network. Yes, As a I think I see. The program is under review and will likely be reduced to the budget. So they did more than they requested, or they just cost more? Bruce may be able to answer that. Is he questioning? Yes, through the chair, I'll hand it over to Bruce. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Councillor. Just making an inference. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, what was that very again? Um, Around the resurfacing number, the the dollars versus the amount what, that completed. One one seven. One one seven. First one off. Sorry, we'll, we'll ask Bruce to answer that, and then we'll come to you, Councillor. Well, well, I just wanted to check. I know um, both our staff sort of pushed the microphones away. I just wanted to check to make sure they are. People online, particularly Gary, can actually hear the staff members all right because that has been an issue in the past. I'm not saying you have to have the microphone yeah. an inch from your face, but can, can you hear us, Gary? Yes, I can. Okay, thanks. I'm doing my best to project. These are all just for Leslie because she's got a beautiful, quiet voice. Yes. Very <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Um, so yes, yeah, so the question again. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Bruce. Yeah. So it was just you, you've just mentioned on there that the resurfacing program has gone over budget, and you're going to look at renewing that, looking at those numbers again, all that percentage of uh, yes. sealed roads. Yeah. So through the chair. So um, so really, what that's saying is that um, as costs have gone up, we're trying to live within our lens a little bit. Yeah. So basically, just just do a better job of uh, being efficient and cutting the cost of sleep. 
that makes sense or not? <laughs> it's all right. Sorry. No, we just going to review it. It's still um, silence. Yeah. Uh, Councillor uh, comment and a question. First of all, I think it's fantastic that we are measuring road debts. Not, you know, that we're, I think it's really, really, really good thing. Um, I'm, I'm just not quite understanding on page 125 um, about the water quality thing. Um, just the right hand column. So it's measured each year. Um, so but we're reporting quarterly, but we can't report because it hasn't been me measured. Mm. It, was it measured last year? Do we report it? It just sounds a bit confusing. Yeah, no, it is. So through the chair, it is a little confusing. So first point around the, um, uh, recording uh, or measuring the, um, uh, the the deaths of serious harm on the road, all the roading measures are mandatory measures that come from the government. So all those measures have to be um, Track and reported on by all councils. So, so those measures are, um, like I say, are set. So we don't choose those as such. But obviously, it is critical that we are keeping our eye on that and making sure that if there are issues that are causing deaths or serious harm on our roads, that we can do the to treat them. Um, on to the um, your um, your second question about the um, about the drinking water. So everything, obviously, these reports are done quarterly. Um, but what happens is, that, and the testing is done, you know. Weekly, there's lots of testing done multiple times through the week. That information all goes through um, the information that used to go through the district health board, you know, to much Arawa, the water um, regulator, uh, and they basically look at everything across a full um, a full year, a full financial year, and then go, this is the result of the year. So it's very hard. We can't report on it through the year because they, they look at it over the year. So we, can, we can't report midway through the year as such. So we will only get an annual report so we so yes so from the um from the district health board previously and from tomato roi we get and they do an annual survey they call it right. and they go through all the councils and they give you like a full this was your compliance for the year and we got that back in august or something different yes yeah, yeah correct. Correct. can i ask a question which is outside of the scope of what we're doing here but it relates to the, the testing um Wastewater testing for illegal substances, is that something that we have access to or is that done regularly? Or, um, so through the chair, um, we don't have access to it. So this has been done regularly. Um, or some of it's done, sorry. So there was so the stuff that was done regularly was the COVID testing, but then there are other testing that is done um, around um, you know, drug use of drugs and wastewater. That's not information that we have access to. So our contractor um, often is the um, the company that does the testing, but that goes off to the government department. So it's not like we jump in the middle and go give them a quick look before we send it off. Um, mm -hmm. Even with the COVID stuff, was the same. We couldn't get access to it; it goes straight through. So there's um, there's obviously quite um, strict chain of custody requirements around all that stuff. The police team produced a report, and um, in my previous role, they did share that report with us, um, and it was quite sobering, I have to say. And that they do produce reports, I'm not sure if it's annually or whatever it is, um, yeah. that compare the various um, locations around the country. And if I recall, I think Eastern Bay and Northland have the highest have their head made mm -hmm. use, um, but they also can they can pick up other the other types of drugs, cocaine and other it's actually really interesting, you know, as I said, so great. Question. Do we want do we want to spend But so there's more information than we could get access to. Is that so what I'm it's, not, it's not one of our not, measures yeah, here, but there yeah. is information that we can access that councillors would like us to. Yeah, and I think like Ali said, it's, it's about it coming back from the, the government agencies like police who are doing that stuff, so it's, it's go to them and try to get it back and I'm asking them to get our hands on right. it. So apologies, it isn't part of this report, so I've, I've taken this off track. I'll now get us back on track. <laughs> Any other questions? Discussion. So I just had a couple around uh, community spaces and development section of the report. Uh, under public toilets. Sorry, Councillor Ronnie, do you mind just giving us your point? Yes, that is on page uh, 10, yeah. starting with page 144 and then going to 145. So under there it says um, level of service, the council's public toilets are clean and safe, and it talks about passing order requirements. 
but just sort of like a couple of, there doesn't that doesn't seem to be that clean and safe thing rather than actual availability and just a couple of examples of availability is that um, here in Thames we had the Thames Civic toilets there's three toilets but one was out of action for um, at least a couple of months needing a replacement door and in fact there was an altercation between plus patrons who were um, two started fighting because they needed to they were arguing over who was going to get to go into the toilet and the Kauranga Valley toilets um, were also locked for several months over winter so I'm just a little bit concerned that and I tried to raise this in the last term but didn't get very far this talks about whether it's safe but it doesn't talk about availability so you could have a clean safe toilet but if it was shut for six months the public are seeing that as well we can't use it so I do wonder if there's any option around availability to be able to be recorded and wonder what other members thought about that. Um, so, so through the chair, uh, that definitely could be a measure that is included in the next long-term plan when we set these measures. So obviously we try and strike the right balance between having enough measures for the different activities, but also not having you know, yeah. huge tones of information. So um, not being onerous on staff to yeah, keep toilets right. once. I understand, <laughs> understand your point totally. Um, yeah, we could close all the toilets and say you were doing a great job and amazing to clean. <laughs> um, so, um, so yes, that's a good point. I definitely think it's something that we can look at as part of the long term plan. Obviously, we work hard, but and the team and our contractors work really hard to keep them open. We have had some real um, challenging <laughs> issues over the last year or two around supply chain issues. You know, around trying to get new. Uh, replacement items, and it's, it seems crazy. You think they'd be, you know, you can just go down to place minutes and grab it, but they're not those kind of items. They're commercial um, standard items, and, and you know, you'd be horrified and surprised for being out of bandwidth that you get mm. on a harmless, um, so expensive, or, you know, like <laughs> yeah. in a toilet. So, yeah, so there are some more challenges where we do end up having to have them closed for longer than we'd like, but happy to um, have a look at that. The end of the as a measure of the money. So, through the chair, yeah. maybe Bruce is that. Captured, you know, of the 78 times that we were to say we've been one fail the building maintenance. Mm -hmm. So would that capture the same months or what do you know? Possibly so different uh, The sound cutting out all the time. Yes, Councillor Gottlieb, I think we are having a couple of technical issues here. Hopefully, that Thank resolves, you. but working on it at the moment. Just, and just sort of like a bit of a follow up. Also, um, a little bit later on in that same report, 146. So, mm -hmm. the measure of the level of service for library is our library service will be accessible to the community and we have a percentage of members who use their who act who use their library card. Yes. Uh, as a regular member of the user of the library, I'm very much aware that there's a lot of people in there using library services that um, don't use their library card. It might not even in fact have a library card, but they're in there to get help with doing CVs, they're in there to get help with um, yeah. or um, folk who just actually go in there and just sit there and read a book for a little yes. bit of time. So um, I don't know how we do that, but it just sort of contrasts quite a bit with the um, Thames Public Swimming Pool, where again that says it has to provide a safe year-round swimming pool. Yeah. But like the toilets, you could, you could close that you know, you could say, well, it's not available. Or there, there's no measure of numbers of people using the swimming pool compared yeah. to numbers of people that use the library. And it just seems there's yeah. a little bit of a... What I'd say, yeah, what I'd say, that's a good point. And I'd, I'd say this is you know, like probably called a transitional measure. Previously, the measure used to be number of people who have a library card. So that was even more blunt, you know, that was like um, lots of people that never have been for the library for 10 or 20 years. So we moved to this one. But what I've discussed with um, with Sharp and our library manager is that we're actually busy at the moment investigating um, the use of the counters on the, on the door, um, the door counters. Okay. So we can actually look, if we do, we redo these measures to use the door counters and the number of people accessing the library as more of a guide as to you know, how popular and how, how available our services. Um, so that's definitely a measure that we're looking at in the next time. Yep. Yeah. 
and, and and with regard to the pool, I guess yes, it's safe and it passes its orders. But again, you know, there could be ten people using it. There could be a thousand. We we don't get a feeling for that from uh, from this report. Yeah, again, I think through the chair, I think that's the one that's around the level of service and how much you know, hours we want to be open and all those kind of things. These measures are really trying to focus down on the really important stuff, and obviously the really important stuff for us is that we meet our full safe mm. um, standards mm. and accreditation. And so, again, we've got, if you look at the community facilities activities, um, we've got quite a few activities, and we've got five times for the five different groups. So we've tried to limit it down to a measure, you know, maybe one or two measures per item within that each of the safe teams. Um, so yeah, but again, I'm happy to have those discussions and work through that stuff when we go through that process. It's kind of Thank you. There's an interesting comparison with recent publicity around Mayor Brown uh, and his numbers for the Auckland Art Gallery, which he said were 9,000 over I can't remember how many weeks, um, and the actual number was 76,000 because <laughs> the 9,000 was only a measurement of how many people have paid for specific things. Actually, 76,000 people have used it because there's no charge, it's free. So you know, those numbers, I think you, Councillor Rodden, you raised a really important point. Um, and those measurements, uh, I'm sure, are not easy. I'm encouraged to hear about the door counters. I think that might be more accurate. So obviously, it can affect funding moving forward if we have actually acted as Mayor Brown yeah, has tried to kill yeah. yeah. uh, Councillor Yeah, I just want to comment on 148, the percentage of parks and reserves main, maintained too. Yes. I think I just want to make a, a comment that they've done a really good job. The recreation service have stepped up in the last uh, few months that they've got themselves organised and the town's looking really nice for Christmas. So, yeah, good. Thank you. Good. So, Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, I noticed last year there were um, been a few challenges because yeah. we were clearly here in the contract and um, I know that uh, anyone was, who was around this table and linked to members were getting a bit of pressure to get here from customers around and things like that. So, yes, I think we appreciate those things. Um, can I add to that by uh, saying I've had two or three visitors come to see me recently and comment on the level of customer service downstairs here at Tim's mm -hmm. office. Very, very impressed, very high, friendly and thoughtful. And so uh, if that could be passed on, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Any other discussion? Did be no. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, just probably for the benefit of the new elected people, um, when you start the LTP process, we'll, we do it in the building blocks. And one of the building blocks is these measures in here. So, over the next 12 months, you'll find yourself a little bit frustrated at some of them and you'll think, well, that's not quite right. So, while, when you do that, have a think about what you might do differently um, for the next period um, when you do the LTP. Because my experience is you, you get to that and it's a really busy workshop and all those great ideas that you've had in the past 12 months sort of disappear. Um, and we end up back again with KPIs that think about what well, could have been better. So, I encourage you just to keep track of what you, what you think as we go forward into the LTP process. And make sure you record what you think you're not measuring properly. Give me some notes too, because some of this has been raised in a previous meeting. But also the other comment I'd like to make to the chair is that we usually report this to risk and assurance committee yeah. but because of the time frames. We, when, when we can't get to risk and assurance, we'll bring it to council. So we'll see that one committee or the other. Thank you, Leslie. Any other discussion? There being none, I'd like to put the motion. All those in favour? No. Those kids? Sherry, <coughs> thank you very much, Bruce, Meg, okay. and Nancy, both of you. Thank you. I think so. Yes. Um, I'm going to. No, we'll do Bruce. Let's take a seat. Um, there is a, a motion on the floor from Mary. <laughs> That we have a cup of tea, but we'll we'll work through with Bruce if that's all right, and then we'll have a cup of tea after that. <laughs> yeah. so, through the chair, can can Harry make a motion? Easy <laughs> <laughs> mm. So I'm going to make the excuse that I'm new in the chair and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I still think it's a good one. So um, item two point eight is Waikato policy. Uh, Waikato regional policy statement. 
change one national policy statement on the business of 2020 or future British strategy. I'd like to put a mover and a second for this to receive the money. Kelly and Peter. And invite Bruce to talk to this. Senator um, Katoa, the change, the reports based on the um, on the uh, proposed change to the regional policy statement that is required by the, uh, the national policy statement on urban development. Um, why we are interested in putting a report, a, a, a submission in, is that um, the, um, the regional policy statement has to put into effect the national policy statement, and the district plan has to put into effect the regional policy statement. So ultimately, these changes will have an impact on the district plan and, and may or may require may, may not require changes. But uh, if we uh, if we don't get in now and say what we want to say about the change to the regional policy statement, then um, we we don't have any um, any status when uh, it comes to uh, those changes being made and whether or not we agree with them. Uh, so that's just a quick summary of um, why we doing the submission. Uh, the submission is attached with the uh, it, um, it addresses the matters that um, as a team we thought needed to be looked at in change one. Um, it may seem strange that we are um, supporting some provisions, but um, if you don't support them and other people oppose them and there are changes made, then you can't have a say later on <coughs> by support for those changes. Um, uh, if, uh, if they are changed, then you can um, make a, uh, um, an appeal and become part of the um, process for um, um, amending that plan through the appeal process. So it's the, the matters that have been um, selected after reading through the change very really carefully and um, looking at how it's impacted on Thames Coromandel District Council um, by the um, inclusion of those uh, those matters that the national policy statement requires the regional policy statement to include. Um, the national policy statement has on urban development has outlined the tier one, tier two, and tier three local authorities. Um, tier one with the Auckland, Wellington. Tier two, uh, um, Bungaree, um, Queenstown, um, that type of local authority. Tier three uh, local authorities with more than 10,000 people in the housing and business area. No settlement in the Thames Coromandel has got to that 10,000 threshold yet. Thames may do so in the near future, and that's why we've got an interest in this. Uh, this change because of the uh, requirements that we will have if and when we become a tier three local authority. Um, I know it's, it's fairly complicated because the RMA is not that simple and the, uh, the plan change is, um, is a complicated, this plan change is a complicated piece as well. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, that the uh, councillors may have. Councillor Roberts. So, at the top of page 164, uh, it talks about entail new additional responsibilities and associated costs for council of monitoring and also involved, may involve changes to the district plan. But then under significant engagement, it says it's not considered to have a high degree of significance. It will have no significant financial impact on council. So have we got any sort of an idea about what those additional costs, maybe? I mean, presumably we're not talking, because it says it's not significant, but do we know? Um, the, that that becomes, comes about when we become a tier three, tier three authority. Right. Um, where we're, we're one of those settlements has over 10,000 people, 10,000 people in the housing and business area. Yeah. The, um, the, National policy statement requires quarterly monitoring of the demand, supply, and pricing of rents for dwellings and the affordability of housing. 
and the um, proportion of housing capability taken up and also data on business needs. So there's quarterly monitoring that needs to be done on those matters um, and that's provided in an annual report. That's just one. So would that, and so would that be across the whole district? Because the other thing it says it's not considered to have a high degree of significance as it doesn't affect the whole district, but it's the whole district becomes a tier three, isn't it? It's not just Thames or Fitianga or whoever get over that 10,000. Chair, I should clarify, the decision to make a submission isn't significant. Like the... Ah, sorry, okay, right, I get it. But it's just Thames. It's, uh, that, is, that is triggered as uh, potentially becoming tier three. It's not the whole district, it's just Thames. So it would be very significant if, and when, if when we become a tier three urban authority, we would be reporting to you on that. Okay. And but that would involve the street plan change. Um, but, but as you know, we've got resource management for, for ongoing at the same time as, as all of this in the okay. So we're doing business as usual now, but with with with, a, with an eye to the future. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So Bruce, just through that, that's my discussion is around with the. Proposed government reforms and chucking out the district plan and putting in a regional plan, and one that covers the whole area, the whole region. Do these, this information flow into that, or will it, it will flow into that? It'll actually, I know that one, uh, regional council does a re, its own regional plan with this NPS that they're putting in. Will that flow into this new regional plan that's planned, or are they going to start again? Well, the, re, the regional plan is uh, um, part of the. Um, the changes to the um, to the R resource management plan that, that will a new regional plan yeah. though yeah that will be introduced to the natural and built environments act when yeah. it becomes an act um, by um, it, the national policy statement on urban development will be incorporated into a national planning framework right. am I right Andrew? <laughs> And that, and that has to be taken into account when you're developing your regional plan. When, when the, the regional planning committee is developing the regional plan, it's not going to be. So that committee, I understand, is going to representation from those people in that, those council in that area, but one council control it or drive it, is that right? Uh, uh, a preferred council. The regional planning committee will develop. But it's at, at when one area, one council will is that they leave it? We will have representation on that council. Yeah, we have representation. A, a council will host the separate area. Host the yeah. Yeah. We, we don't know who that is yet. No. And, and regions will get to decide for themselves. Right. Just on the, um, the, the policy statement at the moment, we're building the national planning framework, yeah. which is getting all those pieces of policy and gluing them together. And of course, in doing that, there's some inherent conflict. So the issues that we've been seeing around natural vegetation yeah. versus the need for housing. This the national planning framework will attempt to address that right. at, a, at a high level, and then the regional planning committee will attempt to address it at the next level down so that we have less um, conflict around resource consents on the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, as long as it flows in, I can see the value. Just an observation I'm just thinking, you know, because um, one of our significant issues that's been raised as an incoming council is around housing. Mm. that this will be quite important for those people who are sitting on that subcommittee that are looking at housing in the future, even when we're not tier three. I think it'd be really good to have eyes all over this and to be following the reports before we become tier three, so it influences or informs the processes that our committee will go through. Absolutely. I think that's a really important point. If you look at um, page 160, the, uh, the MPS, um, it removes overly restrictive barriers to development to allow growth up and out on applications and have good access to existing service, public transport networks and infrastructure. Now, if you look at on the surface of that, that would feed right into what you're saying there. Is it helpful? Is what's around that statement, um, but we certainly need to be aware of it and we need to start thinking now in advance of how we're going to be represented on that regional planning committee because that is the, the key part for getting our voice heard as part of that regional planning um, framework going forward. Yeah. 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 Y
So sorry, I was halfway through my question. Actually, the, the final part of it was how far away is teams from achieving this? You know, what are the? Is it just people numbers? Is it the infrastructure? Is it what is um, it? We've got the spatial information. Yeah. Sorry, can I just clarify? To, if, to, is it ward based? No. The numbers for teams are ward based or not? You know, uh, the, the regional cap, the, the NPS on urban development is not very clear on this issue, and that's part of what we're trying to clarify here. So it says that it's for an area that's, that is or is intended to be uh, 10,000 people or greater in, in population size. It talks about a, a, a housing and business area as well. So the regional council in developing their plan change uh, put together a kind of a, a, a mechanism for for describing what that area is and we agree generally with what they've decided to do um, so they've taken it's not exactly the board but they they've looked at commutable areas in terms of a working a living and working environments so they've looked at all um, commutable areas basically so that puts in some of the some of the settlements up to the north and then some to the south as well because in actual fact you know those of us who travel over the Cocoa and Heck there's a lot of people commuting from front of the town as well yeah. in Tairua, Alamui, so maybe one or two from Virginia. Yeah, so Tent is not far off when you look at those numbers. Do we have a number that's about 8,500 tents? Well, almost nine, I would think. A little bit over nine, so we're almost at 10. Yeah. So when it says in here that it would trigger additional costs and um, Martin was saying earlier on, uh, New additional responsibilities and associated costs. Does it also trigger additional funding and open the door for public transport options? Potentially, okay. depending on where you go, growing. Um, yeah. It's, it, some of this is not it's not very clear how it actually works out on the ground. This is what the regional council has been struggling with. You know, I'm putting together some some provisions in their in their documentation to clarify, and we're asking for further clarification, as you can see. So we, we are, uh, the, the resolution is to approve your submission um, and I'm not sure that any of us are technically minded enough to drill down to this level of formal I'm surprised that there is no national definition of affordable housing. Mm. <laughs> this, isn't there a, it's just a phrase, affordable housing is just a phrase, it's not. That's weird. Calculated based on. You know. I thought there was a stat put out by the government that showed a percentage of your income, a maximum percentage, right. Right. either pay mortgage or rent. Yeah, well, I would have thought there would be something, but here, yeah, that's it's obviously nothing. It's a buzzword because affordable housing is really about the affordable land to build the housing because the housing piece of timber costs. X amount, so it's going to cost more. Yeah, it's all about square meters, but the affordable land is the key to put it on. Some yeah. land is a lot more expensive than others to make the difference. So, so the ten thousand, just go back to that. That number, I mentioned that number. Is that ratepayer number? Is that total residents and ratepayers? Is it non-resident ratepayers and ratepayers? What is that? What's that number mean? The um, definition of the national policy statement says ten thousand people. <laughs> it's not. Right, that's clear. We should all apply. It. So, can I just ask to, in, in um, what series, is it, would it be seen as advantageous yes. to us to have that, to hit that 10,000 tier three mark, or are we just unsure? Without putting yourselves on the line. <laughs> And they actually thought about that one way or the other, we just looked at whether or not we are yeah, or not. Yeah, or not. So it comes with additional responsibilities, but um, it also means that we have to plan better. We have to plan in an integrated way, in the, in the way that we have already started to do this with the spatial plan. So you're saying it would trigger a amendment to the district plan? We, we are already contemplating changes to the district plan as a result of the 10 spatial plan. One of the changes required if you are a tier three local authority reaching that 10,000 people threshold is the removal of car parking standards from the district. Plan. Yes, yes. Except for accessible 
car park standards. So it potentially becomes a an urban environment with the ten thousand plus people. The car parking standards are removed from the district plan. The car parking standards won't apply to the teams or for the area or from the town. Which could assist. Which may or may not be yeah. yeah. And high bill of housing or you know, less garaging and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Councillor Godley, did you have a question? No, I don't, thank you. So you're doing a bit of work at the moment to see whether it, it is advantageous for us to be Tier three versus not. We're looking at the act. Right. The, um, looking to see whether we meet the criteria yeah. and right. what the criteria mean, and we're asking for some clarification of some of these things. Yes. Yeah. So, councils, I think actually whether it's advantageous or not is probably a matter of perspective. Yeah. And whether it's advantageous is probably more call cool rather than staff's call cool because the staff are just here to do their jobs when things get yeah. in. So. But we want you in the game, so we support this. Got to be in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And we will keep reporting to you on this because it's really important. Thank you. Any further discussion? Really important one. Um, I'd like to put the motion. All those in favour? Oh, aye. Those aye. against? Motion is carried. Well done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to quality. Oh, thank you. 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 Th